Hey, Dave Philitis with the Canon Missing Project, uh, copyrighted edition of our YouTube page, and this is a special edition because I'm in with one of the best guys you will ever meet, Ron Moorhead. Aww. Aww. <laughs> Ron and I spent a week together up at his Sierra camp, and it was uh, part of that special edition in the Missing 411 The Hunted movie. And I've always wanted to get Ron on camera talking about that camp. And first of all, Ron, thanks a million. You're a great guy. Aww. Thank you. Uh, how many years have you been going to a camp? 49. 49 years. And how many, did you, did you go every year? Pretty much, yeah. I missed a couple of years because of weather sometimes, but yeah. And, and for the people, speak up as loud as you can. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, I've gone just about every year. Okay. <laughs> and what, what was the main purpose of going to the camp? Well, originally it was for hunting. It's a hunting camp, but... Uh, these things, these, something with a big foot started coming around the camp, so and making these noises. So we started going back, taking tape recorders because we obviously they weren't. A, it wasn't a bear, so we it was a big foot. It had a big foot anyway. It had a big foot. Yeah, let's put it that way. Now, one of the things I asked you in the movie is, did you know a hundred percent what was doing this? No. And you said no. We still don't know. Still don't know. No, it had a big foot, had a big voice, and there was several different ones because different sized tracks. And whose idea was it to record these things and try to get them on tape? Oh gosh, well, it's what we wanted to do because it's so phenomenal. Uh, Al Berry went up there in 72 and he started doing it seriously. We were just kind of, okay, this is kind of cool, let's, re let's record it. But uh, Al Berry, he, he knew there was something very significant about this. We were just kind of, yeah, this is okay, but <clears throat> it's just a wild beast in the woods. And that's what a lot of people still think but I think there's a lot more to them than that now since I've been studying for so long. Now, one of the things that I, I get a lot of comments about is that, well, Dave, how do you know that these recordings were real, et cetera, et cetera. Explain how you vetted those recordings and how you sent them out to professionals. Yeah. Well, Al Berry's responsible for that. He fostered the study at the University of Wyoming for a year. Uh, Professor Curlin, who is a sound technician, he's an electrical engineer, actually. He's written over 100 papers just talked to him the other day, he's still, he's not active, he's retired now, but he he did a report on a year-long study, and that study showed that they were <coughs> way outside the human range, but also within the human range, and uh, he compared them to the human vocal track and showed how big the things would have been that made that compared to an average human male, and uh, that was his study, and then later on, uh, uh, Scott Nelson, a crypto-linguist, retired from the Navy as a crypto-linguist, with uh, close to 30 years experience listening to languages, he got a hold of them by accident from a project his son was doing, and he started analyzing them, and he came up with a statement, these things have a language, a complex language, not just a language, but they hadn't been slowed down or speeded up according to Professor Curlin, and we, we knew that ourselves, but still, you got these critics out there that want to say there's something fishy going on, and these things can't talk. Well, what we were dealing with up there could talk, when I say talk, they talk with a sapient language as we're talking now, and except much more rapid. And uh, that takes something with a human vocal track. Now, everybody has a higher bone, and, but how it's connected with the tongue and the nerves into the brain to give us our sapient talk, which means a, a sentence, a morphine stream of words that make a sentence. These things have that. And uh, I don't think they all have it. Really, truly, I think there's several different types of these things out there <clears throat> with different, different types of attributes and abilities, but what we had up there did have a complex language. So, besides the vocalizations and the prints that you would see, uh, thanks, I'm your pal. <laughs> so, besides that, what other, there were aerial anomalies you had. That yeah. we, we showed one in the film, but what was the other? Well, there's more than one, They're just different things. Uh, lights, balls of lights, uh, sounds that you couldn't find the source of. I mean, metallic sounds sometimes would sound like a big tuning fork above your head. Um, you could never find the source, and it's in the daytime. I've witnessed this up there a couple times. And just a uh, strangeness about these things that seemed to be going along with, the, with these creatures that were up there, whatever they were. And uh, we had, uh, sometimes our, we thought our camp was being tore apart one time, and we looked out there and nothing had changed. <laughs> and we never could explain that. How, how, does, how does your classical science explain something like that? So 
Those are the kind of things that happen. One time you thought a herd of horses were coming down to camp. There's no horses doing that. And you just, they, they, they have a expanded, a very unique vocal mechanism. And they have to, to do the sounds they make. And if these were sounds they were making with a vocal mechanism and not just fooling us some way, because how they did that, how they do any of that stuff. We thought we saw a UFO up there, Bill and I did. One night we'd see this big blue ball coming down. I don't think I mentioned that, but it's just strangeness. And you, over the years, I've heard people report this stuff. I've heard people report about them disappearing, and that's that's unique. I had a, Al Berry taught me years ago. He said, if you ever, when you get to talking about this stuff, keep it, keep with science. And with science, you got to you got to make it sound, sound sensible. <laughs> Classical science does not answer this stuff that we were going through. What science does is quantum science. And yeah. you, you get into quantum science and and then you find there's there's ways that can happen through frequency, energy, and vibration. And you explain that in your latest book. I do. What's the name of that book? Quantum Bigfoot. Quantum, quantum Bigfoot. <laughs> and what's your website? RonMoorhead.com. 10.com. <clears throat> so, okay, so you had vocalizations, you had impressions in the mud, you had aerial anomalies. What was the reason all this was happening at that camp? What's your thoughts? I don't know. I don't know. Other than for some reason they wanted to interact with us or they wanted us to understand something that we weren't understanding at the time, but now I think I am starting to understand it a little bit. They are, uh, I believe, possibly interdimensional just because of what I've what I've experienced and what I've seen and what I've been hearing from other people, how they disappear because of our, our frequency and our limited range of sight is only, is only so much. It's like our hearing. We only hear so much. You, can, you can't hear infrasound. You don't hear ultrasound, but it's there. The so, uh, eyesight's the same way. You don't see everything there is to see. Once you get into quantum physics, you realize that there are more dimensions than the three that we live in. There's 11 at least by the science and the mathematics of quantum physics. And, when you start studying that stuff, you find out that there's things you just don't see. And you get into the theories <coughs> and the uh, hypotheses that some of these guys have, and it's quite interesting to study that. And I, I just suggest to anybody that's, that's listening or interested in trying to figure this thing out is they just reach out and reach up a little bit to quantum science instead of being restricted with classical science only, which teaches us only things that are measurable, predictable, and <coughs> Material or physical. This is not true. That's Newtonian physics altogether. Edgar Mitchell said, in order to have a clear perception, you have to have quantum science and classical science together to get clear perception. And I like that statement. It goes right along with, uh, well, Tesla had a lot of statements and Einstein, but people aren't looking into that. They can only, they only want to go with what they can see and feel with their hands and touch, but there's more going on. That's what I try to suggest that people just look into it before they draw conclusions. So, the reason I had that segment in the last movie is that number one, it dealt with hunters. And would it be true to say that all you guys were armed up there all the time? All the time. And would it be safe to say that there were some times that you were scared poopless? <laughs> well, if you, ask, if you ask Scott Nelson, he would say that. <laughs> There was one time when I was a little bit concerned, I was up there by myself, and you know when that was, it was in 2011, when one of these things was out there tromping around, and I would heard the chatter, so I knew, and earlier that evening I would heard something else that went on the, and uh, yeah, all I had was a little 38 with uh, snake loads in it, or a bird shot, you know, to scare a bear off, and uh, it's a little concerning when you, you, there's no way you can contact anybody, you know, you've been there, <laughs> it's pretty remote. People think uh, they backed up with a truck and had a six-pack of beer and record these things. Well, no, it's not like that, is it? <laughs> no, it's not. It's quite uh, a little trip to get in there. And uh, so... Anyway. Well, you violated one of Dave's big rules. You don't go in alone. Right. Well, I had a guy scheduled to go with me. It was one of the, uh, one of the original hunters' his son. But he backed out the last minute. And Scott and I had been up there, Nelson, been up there uh, three times that summer trying to get some more cooperative uh, evidence. Uh, sound basically that his batteries would go dead or something would go wrong and we never got anything so I thought well what if these things are still around so I decided to go back up 
was in pretty good shape after you walked up there three times, you know. <laughs> so, how many times, what percentage of the times you went up there, nothing happened? Oh, quite a few times nothing would happen, yeah. yeah. Especially after we had to shoot the bearing camp in 76. Uh, you might hear something at a distance, uh, or some kind of anomaly, but the Bigfoot's coming in close like they did before, that stopped after we shot the bear. And, uh, I really kind of feel bad about that in a way, uh, but the bear was rummaging our stuff and we couldn't get rid of him, and he came back and charged at us, so anyway, it just happened, and that happened in 76, and since then we haven't had any close-up stuff other than strange stuff, <laughs> lights and the thing you filmed or heard about. So one of the things that, first of all, I'm grateful, and I'm, I'm humbly grateful that you invited us up there. Thank well, you. Thank you. I'm glad I did, too. As, as you know, the, everything burned down after you left. <laughs> that, uh, was, that was scary for us when we were there, though. It was pretty smoky. Yeah. yeah. There, was, there was no animal sign at all up there, if you noticed. And, and you know, that was one of the things I, I've told people, that I don't think I've ever been that deep in the wilderness ever for a week and not seen one mammal mm. anywhere. That was odd. No bear, no deer. Deer all over up there. Bears all over. A lot of wildlife up there, but not then. Uh, well, when you went up there deer hunting, what was your success rate? It was pretty much 100%. It was when we were hunting earlier, when I stopped hunting after 76. But, uh, yeah, it was, everybody got a tag and everybody We didn't see it. any deer. We didn't see any no, evidence no, of any deer. Nothing. And it was smoky, though. You know, you're, yeah, very smoky. And, uh, Are you sense. planning on going back? I don't have a plan right now to go back. You know, I heard that the other day, the trail, part of the trail that I can get up there, part of the way anyway, is closed off now uh, because of the uh, fires and I don't know, all of my, I asked the actual service, I asked one of the guys to go up there to, uh, and he said they closed the trail, part of the trail. As you know, all the way in the camp there's no trail. You have to go a different way each time. So. No, it's, a, it's a brutal crisscross over granite with mules, backpacking. Yeah. <laughs> But I, I got to say, one of the best things about that spot was uh, the spring. Oh, water. Everybody's got to have water. Water and, uh, yeah, it just, that's where the water starts. Yeah. Or rather, no, it, fresh, and it's, good. it's the only place I've ever been where I've actually drank water coming out of the ground and I wasn't afraid to. <laughs> what can pollute it? Well, yeah, you know, and you always hear about Giardia and things, but if you hadn't said, Dave, you can drink this water, I probably wouldn't have. Oh. But, and, and how about women coming into camp? Does that change the dynamic at all? Yeah, it seemed, it seemed to. We didn't start taking the ladies up there until later on. But uh, when, when we would take ladies up there, uh, which wasn't that often, uh, generally nothing would happen. Uh, I'm not sure if it was because they were concerned to not shoot at them because we were protecting our ladies, or I'm not really sure why. But uh, again, every time you go up there, something wouldn't happen. No, no, so, Nothing would happen every time you went out. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to say. I got to say one other thing, folks, that I've camped maybe hundreds of times in my life. That guy right there, the best cook, camp cook I've ever I've ever been with. I get invited on a lot of stuff like that. <laughs> no kidding. I mean, it took me a while. The guys that were in camp on this trip for us to figure out how good a cook he was, because we brought these. Uh, pre-made meals you pour water in and we ate these for the first two days and we don't we didn't know what everyone brought in by mules and so Ron starts taking out these bags of potatoes and onions and oh my god I'm, the second half of that week we ate really well when we figured out this guy can cook so where'd you learn to cook? I was raised in restaurants I've owned several of them so I kind of know a few, a few Do you cook guys. at home? No I don't what? Uh, not, well, one night a week I have to cook. Oh. Yeah, that's my duty. <laughs> so what, what's ahead for you? What's the next step? Uh, doing a film now, as we speak, uh, about uh, the, the camp and the anomalies associated with it. What it's taken me to today, but it's based on my first book, my chronicle of doing this for 50 years, 49 years. So that's what my project is right now. And I uh, hope to have it out later this year. Later this year? Hopefully. Yeah, it's a lot to do. Do you have a working title that people can look for? No. <laughs> <laughs> but watch your website, which is? <laughs> Again, ronmoorhead.com. And then get your books there? 
Get my books there too, my CDs. Yeah. How about this Sierra Sound? The CD. That's on my website. And folks, I can tell you that if you've never heard the Sierra Sounds, you want to go to the website, you want to get the CD, and you want to listen to it because in all my years in the woods, very few times have I heard anything like this. Only one other time, but it's extremely unique. What makes those so unique, I think, Dave, is <clears throat> the credibility behind them with the studies we've had done on them. Because it's not just some, something we record. We've had scientists and professionals look at those and study them and say, humans can't do that. And if they did, they'd have to be close to eight foot tall. And we, you put that along with the tracks and along with the other stuff that went on up there, and it's a unique story. And I'm glad I'm able to tell it now. Thank you. And, and the big thing to me was this was made before dig digital. So the, these couldn't have been manipulated sounds at the time. That's what they say. And we didn't manipulate them. We know that. <laughs> Plus, you had cooperative. All of us were recording. All of us. Uh, Al Berry's recordings are the ones I had studied. Uh, my really good recordings for the house fire and uh, later a couple of years later and uh, anyway I so happy to get a copy from Al Berry of my interaction with these things and my vocal interaction with them when they were dealing with this outside of our shelter which was unusual and uh, I'm glad I got those back from Al Berry before he passed away so I made my second CD with that showing the wood knocks the whooping sounds my interaction with them and uh, quite a unique night well, Ron and I have done several conferences together, and I can tell you that if you ever see him on an agenda, you want to go and you want to see his presentation because he's really good. He speaks at a high level that I don't understand sometimes, but when you read the book, you'll understand what he's talking about, about the quantum physics. And uh, Ron, I can tell you that you're one of the nicest men I know. Aww. No, really. Bless you much, Michael. <laughs> no, he, you are, and it, it was an honor to spend a week with you in that camp. Dave, thank you so much. I'm so glad you went up there. Thank you. Yeah.